Our topic for this session is spine trauma. We'll be looking at some classic spine fractures and their complications. Beginning with a case of epidural hemorrhage. You can see this is a gunshot wound. There is extensive spinal column disruption. There are numerous hyperdense fragments, a combination of both bone and bullet. And there is significant increased density within the spinal canal itself. It's easy enough to infer the presence of a significant cord injury, as well as extensive canal hemorrhage in, at this particular level. However, both above and below, it's important to appreciate that spinal canal density consistent with epidural hemorrhage extending well above and well below the level of trauma. Note the extent, again, above and below the level of the injury itself. This kind of diffuse abnormality is easy to miss both on CT or MR. But obviously, in the presence of such an extensive injury, you'd have known to begin looking for it. So, that's an extensive epidural hemorrhage. Our next case is a dural arteriovenous fistula. This is also traumatic. You can see anteriorly there is increased density within the spinal canal. In addition, there is a small focus of increased density consistent with contrast. And we, when we look more closely at that, you will see small veins both entering and exiting that region consistent with an arteriovenous fistula. Here it is on the sagittal. You can see the anterior density displacing the cord posteriorly. And here is that spot of increased density that represents the fistula. So first, just appreciate the anterior density throughout the extent of the cervical spine going all the way up to the skull base. Next, let's look at that small dot of increased density and note the entering and exiting vessels. Takes a little zig and a zag right there. And those are the feeding and draining vessels of this AVF. So there is that anterior density on the sagittal. And again, the small dot of contrast enhancement, note the entering and exiting vessels. So that was a traumatic dural arteriovenous fistula with obviously, extensive epidural hemorrhage. Our next case is an atlanto-occipital dislocation. This is nearly always a fatal injury, and it is nearly always associated with epidural hemorrhage in the superior cervical region. So here you see that epidural canal density anteriorly and posteriorly. It is critical to use the orthogonal views to detect this particular disruption, the malalignment of the condyle and of the C1 lateral masses. There it is on one side and on the opposite side. Obviously, the condyles are unseated and distracted. Here on the soft tissue windows, you can appreciate again that anterior and posterior spinal canal density consistent with epidural hemorrhage and again that is a frequent association I don't believe I've ever seen an atlanto-occipital dislocation that did not have extensive epidural hemorrhage so you can see the unseated condyle on the near side and the far side and did the sharp-eyed amongst you note the pterygoid and mandibular fractures present on that side as well? 
So that is an atlanto-occipital dislocation, again, nearly always a fatal injury, and typically associated with epidural hemorrhage. Our next case is a classic hangman fracture. This is a fracture straight through both pedicles with distraction, widening of that space between them. So here you see the pedicle disruption and the displaced and rotated uh, C2 body. Significant anterolisthesis on the sagittal view in spite of which uh, there is significant decompression of the spinal canal typical for this injury. It takes a bit of a kink here but uh, at the C2 level, at the level of the fracture, it is actually decompressed. So there are the disrupted pedicles and the rotational anterior displacement of the C2 vertebral body. And there is one pedicle and the other pedicle defect. And you can appreciate again that significant anterolisthesis. So that is a classic hangman fracture. Our next case is a jumped locked facets. And you can see the reversal of the facet joints right here, uh, upside down or inverted uh, hamburgers. And on the sagittal, this is best appreciated. You see there is uh, complete jumping and locking of the facets with the expected anterolisthesis of that C6 vertebral body. And the opposite side again, frequently a bilateral phenomenon with jumping and locking of the facets. And this is the uh, kind of pattern recognition that's critical on the axials. There it goes. Uh, reversal of the normal relationship of the facets. And again on the sagittal, this is always best appreciated. You can see there is fracturing actually of the articular facet, the superior articular facet of the level below right there. And that too is a frequently associated injury and there's locking of the remainder. Again, the anterolisthesis, and on this side we have the jumping and locking without the fracture. So that's a case of jumped locked facets. That actually was a self-induced injury. This patient uh, broke up with his girlfriend and banged his head against a pole resulting in apparently a, a real whiplash effect to his lower cervical spine. Our next case is a vertebral artery dissection. Here we see the classic injury involving the uh, transverse process and transverse foramen, obviously from the six, uh, sorry, the C6 level up is where the vertebral artery is at risk for this, and you can see that fractured line crossing right across that foramina transversaria. So on this patient's associated MR, note that the hyperintense dissected and thrombosed vertebral artery can be appreciated almost throughout its extent on the sagittal view. I'll go back to the normal opposite side where you can appreciate the flow void within the vertebral artery there. So once I realized that on this particular case, I believe early in my career, I have sought that artery on every sagittal image, and it has often borne fruit. On the 3D, you can see the right vertebral artery is simply absent throughout its length. So here is that fracture through the transverse process and associated foramen.
And here, the normal vertebral artery flow void on the left, and the hyperintense vertebral artery on the right, consistent with dissection and thrombosis. And here is the 3D view. You nicely see the normal left vertebral artery and the absent right. A little bit of retrograde filling at its superior extent. So that is a case of transverse process fracture with associated vertebral artery dissection. Our next case is a relatively unusual injury that frequently results from falling onto uh, the tip of the shoulder with the head splayed away from it. Uh, this is common in motorcycle wrecks. So you can see there is widening of the intervertebral space that is asymmetric and there is obviously a right convex uh, alignment abnormality. This translates to the posterior elements as, where, as well, where you can see there is widening of the facets on that side and widening of the lamina. On this patient's MRI, you can see extensive soft tissue injury and a reiteration of those findings, the asymmetric widening of the disc space. We are fortunate enough here, even with the relatively low resolution, to see this, the thickened and disrupted C6 nerve root, which is a, the dread complication of this particular injury. So this uh, type of injury usually results in a fairly long-term brachial plexus palsy. So there is the widening of the intervertebral disc space as well as the facets and lamina on that side. This is an injury almost impossible to detect without the coronal views. And here we can track that thickened, disrupted nerve root. It is uh, stretched and hyperintense and thickened, most likely discontiguous right here at the level of the foramen. So that is a nerve root avulsion resulting from a motorcycle wreck. Our last case is a complication of severe ankylosing spondylitis, the banana fracture. So you can see there is a widening and asymmetry of this intervertebral disc space. And note, of course, the presence of the endotracheal tube. That is almost always present uh, in banana fractures. I have seen a large number of these resulting from intubation, and it's safe to assume that when you see one of these fractures in the presence of a tube, uh, that perhaps they occurred simultaneously. Your attention is definitely uh, drawn to this fracture by its involvement of the posterior elements. And the posterior element fusion here is what really lets you nail the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, you can see all the way up to the atlanto-occipital joints, uh, there is fusion of these uh, synovial joints. The opposite side, the fracture involving the posterior elements here as well. And again, the fused facet joints. So here again is that banana fracture. You can see it through the posterior elements, but also now really appreciate the fact that it goes through the vertebral column as well. So that is a banana fracture, a complication of ankylosing spondylitis, uh, typically post-traumatic and, uh, again, often associated with endotracheal intubation. And that concludes this session on spine trauma.